First, I'd like to thank Henry for that very generous introduction. Um, and yet, for all of that, um, anything that I might have done literally would fit into a thimble in comparison to the fellow that I have the great privilege to interview. In 1985, Garry Kasparov becomes the world chess champion at the age of 22. This is coming from his Armenian Jewish origins and having been born and raised in Baku, which is the capital of Azerbaijan. He's only 22, yet by 1989, he is being interviewed in Playboy magazine, which you have to remember, this is still at a time when the communist government is in power in Moscow, there's a period of glasnost, but here you have the greatest representation, one of the most famous men in the world now, in his 20s, um, who is saying, contrary to the whole emphasis of the Soviet state on their chess teams as being exemplars of Homo Sovieticus, he says in Playboy magazine that the Americans are truer to human nature. And he creates something of a scandal. He's very precocious. In 1990, he is already explaining to Henry Kissinger in October of 1990 that by the end of the year, there will be no more communist governments left in Europe. In 1990, excuse me, that's 1989. In 1990, he's having a conversation with Condoleezza Rice and Brent Scowcroft, and he explains to them why Boris Yeltsin is the man to watch. And they refer to him as being a drunkard and a not a serious person. Not to Yeltsin, not to me. Yes, to Ye <laughs> they're referring to Yeltsin, quite right, <laughs> as being a drunkard and unreliable, to which he responds, you asked me about his political future, not about his character. He then goes on to support Yeltsin and continues that support um, all the way through until Putin comes into power. Now, as prescient as Garry Kasparov is, and he nails it every step of the way, he's the first to admit that when Putin came into power, he, like most Russians, saw this as being an opportunity to clear up the benign chaos that had overtaken uh, Russia, particularly in the last Yeltsin years. And he gives him the benefit of the doubt. By 2005, he has decided to retire from chess 20 years after having been world champion and joining the fledgling uh, pro-democracy movement in the country. This is an extraordinary turn of events for a man who could very easily have had any kind of sinecure and patronage and instead chooses not to do it. And just to understand the environment in which we're talking, in 2006, just a year later, Alexander Litvinenko is the object of the world's first known case of nuclear terrorism, where he's poisoned with polonium in a London restaurant. Later that year, on Vladimir Putin's birthday, so the message was clear. Anna Politskovskaya, who was the journalist who was the one doing the investigative analysis on Chechnya, is murdered. Subsequently, of course, as we know, the book itself is uh, dedicated to the memory of Boris Nemtsov, who was, like Gary, pro-Yeltsin and was murdered in the last months um, outside the Kremlin gates. So just giving you Tom, the, the story, just you know, just since we had ninety second why, uh, I I do remember when Politkovsk was murdered because at that day I was at this stage with David Remnick. We actually walked in receiving news from Moscow, so that's why yeah, this is that's it's it's I, I couldn't, sorry for interruption, but I just uh, I couldn't help but you know uh, reminding myself about this very very tragic moment. Yet another reason why the 92nd Street Y is the place to be <laughs> and to be seen, always. Remember that, yes. brilliant. At the pinnacle of the events, yes. That's extraordinary. Um, 
What we see with this man is something which is truly unique. You have someone who's one of the most famous people in the world who switches it all to take on a very, very dangerous occupation. An hour ago, I happened to be at an event with John McCain and Lindsey Graham. And I mentioned that the reason why I'm leaving is because I have the great privilege of being able to interview um, Gary Kasparov on the 92nd Street Y stage. And the response that both of them gave, and McCain just nailed it, he said, this is a very great man, this is a very great book that he has put out, and this is more than anything else the story of a very brave man. So I urge you all to read the book, but before I turn to our guest, I want to read you just one paragraph of it because everyone should read this book for two reasons. Number one, because winter is coming is the metaphor for our generation and the twilight struggle that we have with the countries that Gary refers to as the hypocrisies rather the than the democracies of which Russia and Iran are amongst two. He writes of August 17th, 2012, three years ago, when he was uh, taken into custody and beaten up by the police. I'm not objective about the events of that day, but I don't think that an unarmed chess player nearing his 50th birthday presented such a terrible danger to an army of riot police. But while I was bruised for quite a while, I was lucky not to suffer any permanent injuries. My spirits were good enough that I could laugh when the police issued a statement that they were considering filing additional charges against me for biting one of the officers on the finger during their assault. Well, I am by no means a vegetarian, though as I turned 50 a few years ago, I've had to cut back on red meat on my doctor's advice. But I can say with certainty that were I to acquire a taste for human flesh, the way Bengal tigers are said to do, I would never bite anyone under the rank of general. <laughs> This is to go to the point that not only is this an extraordinary story with an extraordinary message, but it is also beautifully written. You will love the book, trust me. So with that, the arc of your career and your life having been so rich and having been positioning yourself for being co-opted by any government in Russia to be an icon of the state if you had gone along with what you saw coming. Where to now, Gary Kasparov? Yeah, one of the stories of this book, um, it's the rise and fall of uh, Russian democracy. It's from Gorbachev's retreat from um, uh, Eastern Europe to Putin's invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, there is no Siri in the book because the book was delivered to the publisher before it started, but you can just read it between lines that uh, Putin would be finding another spot to create cows, to stock cows. And uh, uh, Siri definitely was, was one of the points that he already had in mind. Um, I, I was celebrating with uh, millions of my compatriots and with tens or hundreds of millions of people around the world, the end of communism in 1991, and I decided that it would be appropriate to, to, to uh, start the book, uh, uh, just sharing these emotions. And uh, um, I tried to explain how, how on earth you know, we could move from these celebrations and joyful days of August 1991, where the statue of the founder of KGB, Felix Dzerzhinsky, was just brought down, uh, from at Boston and at, at Lubanka Square to year 2000 where um, KGB Lieutenant Colonel was granted presidency. Yes, we still had some kind of elections, but it was obvious that uh, a appointed successor, Yeltsin's successor, um, uh, with full support of, uh, um, of the state machinery at that time uh, would be an easy winner. And as you pointed out, he was young, uh, he was energetic, and uh, many people, uh, including myself, uh, hope that things could change for better. But you know, my, the, the period of benefits of the doubts for Putin was much shorter. So this, I already saw uh, this, this change in the beginning of year 2000 because the first act 
of Putin as a president was to restore the Soviet anthem. Many people say it's symbolic. And my response was exactly, it was symbolic. And it was like a Freudian message to all of us. This is what Putin could do if given the chance. Um, and uh, uh, the man repeatedly said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical disaster. That's another indication of his uh, uh, vision of the future, uh, or actually, you know, uh, future being part of the, of the past. Uh, and uh, also, um, he said at least once, once KGB is always KGB. Um, and uh, uh, his immediate attack was against free press in Russia. And so the, even you know, within a few months of his presidency, I uh, lost all illusions about uh, him being a reformer. And I already could see a, a potential danger of uh, him dragging country back to maybe not to the Soviet days, but to something that I definitely didn't want to see. And my first uh, um, harsh criticism of Putin uh, dated uh, all the way back to year two, uh, 2001. In the beginning of January, um, I wrote an editorial for the Wall Street Journal, Trading in Fear. And that's what I believe would be Putin's long-term strategy, using fear first inside, inside Russia for um, consolidating his power, uh, and then eventually uh, spreading fear and terror uh, worldwide, as every dictator did before. So the decision to move into what uh, many people mistakenly called Russian politics in 2005, um, because you know, when you say politics in this audience or in, in, in any democratic country, people immediately think of uh, registering political organizations, uh, fundraising, uh, uh, debates. Putin never participated in a single debate in his life. Um, uh, rallying uh, for support of your favorite candidates um, uh, and having elections. So, um, uh, in Russia, you know, we, we never fought to win elections. We were fighting to have elections. Um, and uh, when people ask me immediately, just when I announced about my decision to uh, leave professional chess, whether my chess experience could help me in uh, navigating in these uh, uh, rough waters of Russian politics, my response was absolutely not. Because in chess, we, we have um, fixed rules and unpredictable results. In Putin's Russia, is exactly the opposite. So results stay, stay the same. And rules change every time Putin, Putin finds it fit. Uh, uh, um, and uh, um, um, I um, uh, thought that it was my like, moral duty um, to uh, invest my popularity, my, you know, sta uh, my uh, personality as, as a so former Soviet world chess champion, somebody who was well known to the Russian audience, somebody who had no agenda uh, except uh, uh, trying to, to help his own country, uh, to stop this, this, this process of sliding down into the, in the dictatorship. Unfortunately, it did work out, so I knew that it was an uphill battle. I knew it was not just about winning or losing, it was not a game of chess. Um, but uh, what actually, um, uh, uh, pro I wouldn't say it was the only reason, but one of the reasons we couldn't succeed, and now you know, analyzing the game is like a post-mortem of what's happened uh, since 2005, I could say that, and that's, that's, that's a very important part of the book, that the role that the Western democracies played in this process, or you know, to be more precise, the role they decided not to play in this process, helped Putin at first to uh, to consolidate his power in Russia, to um, get credentials he needed so badly as the democratically elect elected leader, to um, uh, create a network of, of um, lobbyist agents, uh, friends around the world, uh, before he turned uh, into a more traditional uh, stage of dictatorship, uh, uh, spreading uh, uh, terror um, outside, uh, outside of Russia. So in 2008, after Putin's invasion of, of the tiny Republic of Georgia, I predicted that uh, in, my, in my newspaper article that uh, the next target, I didn't say when because it's, you know, it's, it could be any time, but next, next target for Putin uh, uh, would be Ukraine, U uh, Russian enclaves in Ukraine, because it was it's quite obvious to me that uh, Putin believed 
that all former Soviet republics, they were part of a um, sphere of influence for Russia. And this is the way he wanted the world to be, to be ruled. Uh, and he was always looking for these grand deals. So uh, territories uh, of the former Soviet Union, he believed were part of, um, you know, of his domain uh, or realm. Um, and uh, I've no doubt that if not for NATO membership, uh, for, uh, for Eastern European countries, especially uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, Russian tanks today would be already rolling on the streets of Tallinn, Riga, and Vilnius. Uh, because we, as we could see, three countries from the former Soviet Union that wanted to move uh, to the West, Georgia, Republic of Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, they, two of them were you know, directly attacked by Putin, and Moldova is a part of the, is a part of the ongoing uh, uh, crisis uh, caused by, by Russian-backed separatists. Lenin once said, thrust with a bayonet. If you encounter mush, proceed. If you encounter steel, withdraw. He's not encountered any steel. And you refer to him very interestingly because he appears to many of us to be quite calculating in what he's doing. You say of Putin that he's not a strategist. He's basically a poker player and a very aggressive poker player. Is this, at what point does he continue to stop thrusting? Um, yeah, it's, it's a very good point. Um, and as a chess player, probably I could, you know, um, use some chess metaphors. Um, and I could say that dictators, they cannot afford long-term strategy. Uh, they are very opportunistic. Uh, maybe in the beginning of the rule, you know, they can just make some midterm calculations, but eventually they reach, they reach a point where they have to grab the opportunity. And they also have to watch their backs. So that's why, you know, it's all about um, um, finding moves, winning moves now that could help them to survive. It's a, it's a survival mode. It's dictator worries about what's happening today, maybe tomorrow morning. Um, they are, in chess terms, more tactical. So they're looking for the for immediate opportunity to, sort of to gain some advantage. Because image is everything. Uh, at a certain point, it's not about results. It's about interpretation of the results. It's about virtual reality. That's why propaganda is so important. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, alongside with military expenditure and security apparatus, propaganda is, is one of the kind of sacred items of Putin's budget. You know, when he cuts everything, those three are intact, or even you can see the, the steady increase of, of spending, even despite, you know, the, the economic hardship and, and the lack of uh, financial resources, uh, you know, not, not having the same luxury as he had before by throwing money right, left, and the center. Um, uh, and um, uh, I always, you know, um, wanted to defend the integrity of my game because when I hear, you know, Putin played chess and Obama played checkers, so I, I thought it was just, you know, insult for the game. Yeah, uh, I mean chess. Yeah, um, uh, because Putin is, you know, it's again chess is strategy, and also chess is a hundred percent transparent game. So you have all information about opponent's uh, um, resources in front of you. You don't know what he or she is planning to do, but at least you know exactly what are what what are the tools and means that could be used sort of to cause damage uh, for your position. Uh, dictators hate transparency. Uh, so that's why Putin, you know, is much better in, in, in playing poker. Because in poker, you can win by having weak cards. It's all about your, uh, your guts, you know, it's your, uh, um, your, your, your will uh, and um, your ability to raise stakes and to bluff. Uh, Putin keeps playing with weak cards. Uh, it says, I don't know, he has a weak hand, pair of five, pair of six. But it doesn't matter whether Obama or Merkel, they have, you know, uh, a full house. You know, you have to, uh, you know, stand firm against um, Putin's bluff and eventually to call the bluff. Um, and for those who, you know, um, who are saying that, you know, calling the bluff could be very dangerous because he's a crazy man and, you know, he could do whatever. Russia is still, you know, a very powerful country, though, of course, Russian military today is the pale shadow of what Soviet Union had. I'm not even speaking about Russian economy, but there is a, there are nukes. That's, we, we, we know that. But then for those who are complaining uh, that there's nothing can be done today, so we, can, we can't whine about events that we cannot stop. So as John Kerry said today, 
So I could remind them that in 1946, Harry Truman administration faced not Vladimir Putin, but Joseph Stalin. And we should I mean, just recognize the fact that Soviet Union in 1946 was much more formidable for than Putin's Russia today. You know, it just, I recently read the book, you know, 1946. And it's just, and when I understand, you know, the problems that American administration faced at that time, you know, refugees, you know, just whole Europe, you know, economies destroyed, Soviet, Soviet troops occupied half of Europe, ready to attack Turkey, you know, problems in Iran, you know, the explosion in the Middle East, you know, the collapse of British, uh, British Empire, now India and Pakistan, then civil war in China. When you look at all these problems, I mean, you, you do understand that today we, we live in, in, an, in phenomenal comfort. And we are still not capable of making decisions because we, we lack what Harry Truman and his administration had at that time. And many presidents after, uh, after him also had. We lack political will. And also understanding, you know, we don't have the same clarity, you know, of, of sorry to use just metaphor, black and white, you know, just uh, good and evil. Um, and it's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the biggest problems today in the world that American foreign policy that from Harry Truman to Ronald Reagan was fairly consistent. Uh, with, okay, deviations, but both Democrats and Republicans, you know, they could have their differences, but within the range. Since 1991, you know, from the last year of Bush 41 to Bill Clinton to Bush 43 to Obama, it's just it's like a pendulum. It's swinging from one side to another, which creates great uncertainty. Um, and uh, it's, it's very difficult, you know, for people around the world, I mean, just to understand what the, what the uh, uh, I wouldn't say the only superpower, probably that's a correct assessment, still the, 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 the America, uh, which is still seen as superpower by many, uh, and definitely the, the, uh, the most globalized economy, the most powerful military, what America will do next. And uh, uh, expecting that the next the new president will most likely you know, change the direction of the country again creates uncertainty. And uncertainty is good for bad guys. Because simply you know, walking away you know, uh, uh, and creating vacuum doesn't solve all the problems. So, and, and when people say, oh, there is the, is, there's a choice, either war, or appeasement. I can tell them that you know, between war and appeasement, there is the vast territory called leadership. Yeah. And, and, it's, it's <laughs> and it's not just about you know, using force all the time. So this is, yes, I mean, it's just when you look, go, look back to you know, Harry Truman or John F. Kennedy or Ronald Reagan, you know, they, it's, it's, they were facing you know, imminent threats from the Soviet Union, but you know, it's because the Soviet leaders knew that they were they were encounter steel. Mm -hmm. Even Joseph Stalin, you know, backed off in 1948 when Harry Truman decided to save West Berlin. And there were many other cases where Stalin- 46 in, in, in Iran. No, 46 in Iran, 46 in Turkey. Yeah. So we can just, you know, and, and then, you know, civil war in Greece. So, and, you know, half of Europe was saved because, because of the uh, decisive, bold moves made by the administration. By the way, not having nearly the same resources as, 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 as America can, can uh, uh, employ today. And when people ask me about, you know, um, what kind of uh, uh, means and tools could be used by the United States today against Putin's Russia, my response is, I remember once I answered this question on the floor of New York Stock Exchange, it's a CNBC interview, and I said just from this very floor, Today, you can cause more damage to Putin's Russia than all U.S. presidents from Harry Truman to Ronald Reagan could do to the Soviet Union during the entire Cold War. So it's all about political will, and, uh, and I think that it's, it's, um, it's the right time, I, I believe, for, for Americans to actually have a proper debate about bipartisan foreign policy. I mean, to understand that, you know, uh, America's absence in the world is not going to solve problems, it's going to create new problems. And uh, yeah, many complain about America being a sheriff, or a policeman, but you know, what about not having policemen on, uh, on a bit? So this is the world without any police force, it's much more dangerous place. You don't trust me, ask Syrians. So Putting that into the American context then, actually Putin has played a rather intelligent hand. He seems to understand that the Americans will rarely be uh, forced into um, reacting unless you specifically step on their toes. So as you point out, on 9-11, the first call to come into George Bush 
was from Putin offering his support. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, if you look back over American history, we didn't get involved in World War I until the Germans declared unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic as an act of desperation. That brought the Americans in. Until December 7th, 1941, the vast majority of the American people had no desire to intervene in Europe or in Asia. Roosevelt did not have a mandate. And it's even arguable whether he would have had a mandate against Hitler if Hitler hadn't declared war against us um, even before we declared war against him. 9-11, Americans had not even heard of Al-Qaeda despite the fact there'd been a previous attack on the Twin Towers. We'd had two of our embassies destroyed in Africa. We don't tend to get really riled up until someone kills somebody. A couple of hundred thousand people died in Syria. We didn't get involved until a few Americans were beheaded. And he has managed to keep his, except for Snowden, he's managed to keep his activities in places where he knows Americans have no particular interest, like Ukraine and like Syria or Georgia. Basically places in the, his near abroad, but not so interesting to us. What would it take, in your view, for the American public to really start that debate that you're referring to? Um, I'm just trying to sort of contemplate all, everything you said. So it's just, it's, uh, I think in 1940, America was already somehow engaged in, 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 in helping Great Britain. Uh, yes, but, and lend debate was won in the beginning of 1941. In, in February, America, lend actually- There know, would have been no troops. No, 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 but, just, but still, you know, just, just Roosevelt knew that uh, the, the Great Britain and all other countries fighting, um, fighting uh, Hitler uh, and, and uh, um, Hitler's allies, uh, they needed support. So um, it was, again, yeah, it was gradually moving in this direction, but you're right, so, at, and as uh, many German generals, you know, they just, I think it's Rommel who wrote in his diary that that was the worst day when Hitler declared war on America because technically, you know, uh, there was no need. So this is the, the German-Japanese treaty did not require Germany to uh, declare war on a country attacked by Japan. So, but, you know, it's... Uh, he made it easier for, he made for it, Roosevelt. Oh, he made, he made it, yes. That's, and the Japanese, I mean, the fact... Anyway, that's what happens with all dictators, you know. At a certain point, you know, they made mistakes because they believe, you know, that they are just like unbound. They can just, you know, send challenges all over the place. So, and they just, you know, by the way, all dictators, they tend to underestimate the United States. So Hitler definitely didn't understand what kind of power, you know, he was bringing in. So American uh, technology and eventually American troops uh, um, and, and the amount of military supply to the Soviet Union, which helped Soviet Union to uh, uh, sustain German invasion and then eventually to, to have uh, enough technological capacity to push uh, 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 Germans back very fast. Um, and I think that uh, even, even, you know, even Stalin, had, but probably Stalin already had some ideas but because he was afraid of America, especially because of a nuclear bomb. But still, you know, the, the power of the, uh, of the United States based on the, f on, on the very foundation of the free world, on the values that helped to create this, this country, uh, I think it's, they, they, they're still being heavily underestimated by, by uh, the dictators. Now, we're looking at- Actually, can I just ask you a question? Do you think that there's a connection between our blinking on the red line in Syria in 2013 and the fact that in 2014, for the first time since Saddam Hussein, a piece of a sovereign country was annexed by another country? Well, I think it's all, this, everything is connected uh, because um, Obama demonstrated that he would not intervene anywhere, I mean, probably unless U.S. interest is, is directly involved, though many could argue that, you know, uh, Syria is just bordering Israel. So, and this, 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 this region definitely, you know, is quite an explosive one. And uh, I can hardly imagine, you know, that America, America will, will simply walk away from, from the Middle East, you know, um, uh, leaving, uh, uh, leaving a hell behind. Uh, because it will not be contained in one region. We live in an interdependent world. So the world is getting smaller thanks to these new technologies invented, you know, in, in, in a free world, by the way. Uh, but um, um, I, I think it's, it's, we are reaching a point where, you know, um, uh, this country is, is, is poised to have this debate. 
definitely you see very powerful, you know, uh, isolationist trends on both sides of the political spectrum. You, you, it's both on the right and on the left. You have people saying that this is not, you know, this is not our fight. You know, we, we have to concentrate only on jobs and, and on, on domestic uh, affairs, security at home, without recognizing the fact that, you know, the most globalized economy cannot afford to disassociate from global affairs. Because America, you know, has interest, set aside politics, you know, economic interest almost everywhere. And uh, free world needs, you know, new markets and needs more cooperation. We have to create, you know, more financial, cultural, polit uh, political, uh, social, uh, business ties with other countries. The problem is that now we encountered an enemy that is quite different. This is not a, an existential enemy to, uh, like the Soviet Union that everybody could see the, uh, the, so the borderline, the Berlin Wall. It was something that divided the free world from an un, from, uh, uh, un free world. Um, uh, we are facing an enemy that uh, had no choice, have no choice, but to confront us uh, in, in, in all sorts of skirmishes uh, because the moment we, uh, we move, you know, um, we, we, we move in the direction of peaceful cooperation, I mean, for Putin, Iranian mullahs, for ISIS, for uh, all sorts of facts and terrorists and dictators, I mean, they, 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 lose, they lose their credibility in the eyes of their subjects, of those they govern, because they cannot compete with us in ideas, innovations, productivity. They need conflict. Conflict is something that feeds their, their uh, their claims for power. They can cling to power by, by stalking cows, and uh, they know that they, only, they have only one competitive advantage over us. It's a value of human life. For us, each human life is unique. For them, killing a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, God forbid a million, is just a demonstration of their strength. So that's why uh, this is a conflict that we cannot avoid. Uh, Europe actually that now is, is about to recognize it, 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 uh, this sad truth as, uh, as well, because Europe always tried to offer incentives, always, always try to negotiate, to offer compromises, but again, they're facing an enemy that uh, um, has no appetite for compromises. It's my way or highway. This is the way Putin war, uh, uh, operates, or uh, Iranians, and of course, you know, uh, other, other dictators and terrorists, they, they, have, they have the same attitude. It's a, it's, a, it's a great point because you mentioned in the book that uh, dictators very often use this humiliation psychosis and the myths about the country having been humiliated by its enemies in order to be able to galvanize public opinion. So the Iranians have done this regarding 1952 and the overthrow of Mossadegh, for example, which they blame on the Americans, even though it really was an act which was perpetrated by the Ayatollahs, the clergy, in concert with the military. Hitler did it, the stab in the back concept after World War I. And you see with the Putin narrative this idea of being able to restore greatness um, amidst humiliation. And when you look at it that way, and you think of some of the candidates running for office today, isn't it a rather queer thing that Vladimir Putin praised Donald Trump, and queerer still that Trump embraced it? Are you surprised? Um, I think is this the, uh, if you look for Trump analog in European politics, it's Berlusconi. Uh, though I think it's just Berlusconi is probably you know, more shrewd as a politician and just he knew how to combine business and politics. Trump never had the same experience before, but I'm, you know, I'm sure that the way he sees the world is about making deals. He doesn't have any values. And I just, you know, I, I think it's, it's almost insults the memories of Reagan when Trump you know, talks about Reagan also evolving. Uh -huh. So Trump keeps evolving every minute. So, so he, he can change his mind, you know, if it fits uh, him. And, uh, and I don't think he really understands, you know, most of the things he's, he's trying to sort of touch on the surface. Um, it is, it, 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 but by the way, but it's, it's, it's a reflection of the sort of the current mood in the country because a lot of people are looking for simple solutions. 
And, uh, and you can also look, you know, on, on, on the opposite side. I mean, it's just you have a socialist, you know, just uh, it's, uh, running neck to neck with Hillary Clinton, a socialist. And, uh, you know, I uh, always remind people that the collapse of democracy in Germany was not just because Nazi got, uh, in 1932 elections, got 38%, but bec because communists got 16 So when you have 50 plus percent of population voting against democracy from both sides, that's, this is a danger. I mean, I have no, again, no intention of comparing uh, uh, Trump to Hitler or, uh, no. or Bernie Sanders to, to Ernest Tellman. <laughs> but, but basically, we're talking about, about people you know, attacking the very foundation of the sort of mainstream democracy from, from, from uh, uh, two, two opposite sides. And uh, you know, um, the, I don't like the combination of nationalists and socialists. That, that it definitely creates something that you know, it, uh, uh, revives uh, bad memories. But if we get to, if the, the, the reference that I was making was what we hear a lot is this um, humiliation concept that uh, everyone's taking advantage of us. The Mexicans are taking advantage of us. The Chinese are taking advantage of us. Everything is going to hell. And it's striking a chord. Um, and as you say, you've got one poll with that and another poll which is giving a lot of credence to someone who is a, for anyone who watched Saturday Night Live, a democratic socialist. Um, if you're looking at it through that prism, and if, as you say, a dictator needs to be able to maintain his momentum, he may not be a strategist, and you're obviously a very strategic thinker, but as a poker player, what might some of his next moves be if nobody opposes him? Uh, no, he, he's not you know, going to create a conflict just for the sake of conflict. I think it's, it's, he, he does it when he needs you know, he needs a sort of new rationale to sort of boost his propaganda and, um, and to basically, you know, um, save him, uh, save him from, from trouble uh, uh, within his inner circle. Uh, right now, I think he is, is in a waiting mode because uh, he's, he's, he, he hopes that some sanctions will be lifted. And it's, he doesn't care about the Russian economy because it's, just, it's, it's a free fall uh, uh, economy. But, what he cares, it's about an image. So if he can convince Western politicians to leave sanctions, that's a big victory. So that's why you could see you know, um, uh, top tier emissars visiting Moscow. You have the uh, head of the um, uh, Christian Social Union, the I know, president of Bavaria visiting Moscow. You have Henry Kissinger, um, calling Putin my you know, good friend and, uh, and uh, uh, asking uh, uh, Americans, uh, uh, Washington and Moscow sort of to uh, go beyond the grievances. As I said, to go beyond the grievances of Ukrainians, Syrians, yes, and families for Boris Nemtsov, Anna Politkovskaya, Alexander Litvinenko, you can have a very long list of grievances that Kissinger wants to, to, to throw away. Um, and uh, Putin, Putin's lobbyists uh, are working, has been, have been working very hard in Europe, also in this country, uh, trying to sort of to score a victory for him. If he fails, and I think it seems that you know that it's for European politicians, no matter how much they want to cut a deal. I mean, seeing the carpet bombings in, in Aleppo, I mean, just a war crimes committed under Putin's direct orders, uh, at the pretext that he's fighting ISIS, and of course he's not. Um, he's just bombing American-backed or Turkish-backed rebels uh, um, who have been fighting Assad for many for uh, many years. Um, so it's very difficult to actually um, you know consider. Uh, uh, or keep calling Putin a part of the solution where it's obvious that he is, you know, the main source of the problem. Uh, and um, at one point, he will look for uh, new targets. And um, uh, naturally, one of the targets is, is in the Baltic, Baltic region. Uh, yes, of course, Baltic countries, they are members of NATO, and that what saved them up to now. But uh, uh, two of them, Latvia and Estonia, they have a considerable uh, portion of Russian ethnic Russian population, uh, uh, especially in Estonia, they live in an enclave uh, next to the border. Uh, they are also a similar you know, um, location in Latvia near the border. And uh, um, if economy you know, keeps going down, oil price uh, well, uh, is what, you know, below 30 now, um, uh, dollars a barrel, uh, he might look for some kind of hybrid um, war in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, um, a uh, region, uh, and um, I don't know whether you know uh, whether 
as I said, you know, United States, the West will have some um, political will to, uh, to intervene. Though it will be NATO country, again, I, I hope it's not going to happen, but, but we could see that he keeps raising the stakes. And uh, now he reached a point where the next aggressive act most likely should be against NATO country. Um, and uh, I'm sure there will be voices on both sides of the Atlantic uh, calling for restraint, for caution, because it's not a direct aggression, it's, uh, it's an ethnic conflict, uh, it's, you know, there, there will be a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, um, uh, 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 there will be many calls to, to not to get involved with an, with an open conflict, though the NATO, the NATO uh, uh, um, uh, charter uh, implies that attack against one country is attack against every other country. So I think the most dangerous moment probably could be n uh, this coming summer. Because we, if you remember, Putin attacked the Republic of Georgia in August 2008. And uh, I think this is, this is a moment where Putin could see as a window of opportunity. You already have, you know, the president who is just, you know, sitting the few, last few months. And you still don't have a clear winner on the other side. So it's like, you know, it's, it's a limbo period. So, it's, so if he attacks, I'm sure you'll use this, this uh, window of opportunity. Uh, and that's why I think the next uh, 10 months will be, will be uh, uh, um, very, very dangerous since uh, Putin definitely will be, will be looking for some kind of uh, new entry. And it seems that the free world is not ready to confront him. Actually, it's this, it's maybe the free world is ready, but what is important, Putin doesn't know it. And uh, for what he saw in the last few years, actually convinced him that there would be no, uh, no steel that he could meet with, with uh, uh, when he pushes his bayonet. No question, the greatest mistakes are made by not really understanding your successes as opposed to not understanding your failures. Look, uh, it's the, it's, again, it's very important to, to, to remember, you know, the lessons of the Cold War because it was not, you know, uh, um, a partisan agenda. It was a bipartisan agenda. And it's, it's I, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, um, quite upset to, to, to hear today that is just, it's the, many people, you know, keep saying that, you know, the sort of the, the, uh, the freedom agenda is the, it's a neocon agenda. Actually, it came from Harry Truman and John F. Kennedy. So uh, we dare not tempt our, our enemies with weakness. That's JFK. So it's, this is his inaugural speech. So they knew that, you know, they had an enemy to confront and they knew that every sign of weakness will be used against them because next time you will have to use real force. So credibility, that was something that helped America to win a Cold War. And I think this, the, the last uh, 25 years definitely damaged quite badly the credibility of the Oval Office in the eyes of, of uh, um, people around the world. And yet you could probably say that a lot of that is a function of common sense. Now, Voltaire said that common sense is not so common, but I think you quote Sakharov to say that you should not expect that any government that treats its people badly will treat its neighbors badly. And so, in a sense, not much of this should really be a surprise. And yet, it seems to have become a surprise because we didn't want it to work this way. We wanted the Cold War with the Soviet Union, then Russia, and now maybe whatever is being made in its place, to be over so that we could go about making money and oh, living. Which is, living. which is understandable. You said common sense, you know. Uh, I was very happy when Francis Fukuyama so agreed to, to, um, to give a blurb to the book because somehow the, the book, you know, is, is a delayed uh, response to, to his best-selling book in 1992, The End of History. And I was among those who believed that, you know, we reached the end of history and the liberal democracies have won convincingly and uh, the rest... Uh, the rest will be a matter of technique. So we'll just start, you know, building a new future. It's all, you know, uh, um, about, you know, uh, uh, joy, celebration, and, you know, uh, cooperative and creative work uh, for, for the mutual benefits uh, tomorrow. Um, but we're wrong. I mean, the evil doesn't disappear. Uh, the evil, you know, it's, I mean, it could be buried temporarily under the rubbles of Berlin Wall, but eventually it sprouts out. Um, and that's what we found out. And uh, because Berlin Wall, you know, created, you know, a, a physical line, so it was easier for us to understand there was an enemy. Now, 
you know, we live in a world where just, you know, it's the, the all these, these boundaries, they just, they, they are, they're quite blurry. Um, There's a wonderful passage in the book where you say, forgive a, um, a chess player for believing, and you're referencing evil, um, for believing that sometimes things really are black and white. They are. And so let me ask you this question, because we have this extraordinary alliance of two regimes that have a common interest in instability, especially with $30 oil. Today, Angela Merkel expressed outrage at the carpet bombing that the Russians were implementing in order to be able to provide air support to Iran and Hezbollah in pushing the Assad forces up north towards the Turkish border. So the question here is, um, and the implications, we're already seeing them right now. How strong is the relationship between Iran and Russia? I think Iran has been playing its own game. So um, it's very convenient for Iran to uh, use Putin's ambitions in the region. But uh, definitely Iran is a great beneficiary because I understand what Iran wants in the region. So as a Russian citizen, I don't understand. No, was granted uh, uh, a superpower, superpower, regional superpower status by the deal with the with the United States. I believe it was a terrible deal that empowered Iran. Um, and Iran now sees great opportunities of you know of uh, sort of uh, of cashing its chips uh, in this local casino. Uh, Iran already had a huge success of basically you know taking over the Shia part of Iraq. Uh, it's it's. Uh, Probably it's for centuries, you know, they just, they, they, they couldn't expect this to happen. So, and definitely in the 20th century, you know, that's, that's for them, that was the, that was always beyond their, their wildest dreams. Um, Iran um, uh, has powerful Shia terrorist network throughout the region, you know, from Hamas and Hezbollah uh, um, uh, uh, in Syria and Israel, uh, um, uh, Lebanon and Israel, uh, to um, to Yemen, so where there's the Iranian-backed uh, rebels are just fighting, you know, um, uh, Saudis or other, you know, Sunni, uh, Sunni troops, um, and uh, uh, Iran naturally wants, you know, wants, uh, uh, you know, to extend its control of of uh, of, of the region, uh, and unfortunately, you know, Putin is is quite helpful, um, but um, again, I don't think Iran, you know, is is um, uh, is devoted to Putin's interest. Putin is very important because Putin always protected Iran against any, um, any um, enemy's actions. And since 1995, that's important to remind people, Russia has been the principal supplier of nuclear te technology to Iran. Actually, Bill Clinton was the first president of the United States who raised this issue with Boris Yeltsin in 1995, having a resolution passed, bipartisan resolution, passed by the US Congress uh, you know, demanding the end of Russian uh, nuclear assistance to 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 to, to Iranian regime, uh, um, and threatening you know to withhold financial aid, which was vital for for Yeltsin at that time. Unfortunately, Clinton decided it would be against U.S. national interest uh, to push this to push this uh, um, uh, agenda, and uh, he basically you know let it uh, 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 let it go. Um, so um, then Russia helped a lot. Uh, uh, in in uh, um, um, uh, protecting Iran uh, during this very dangerous period of sanctions, and uh, I have no doubt that this cooperation never uh, uh, nuclear cooperation has never never stopped. And um, uh, now Iran sees that uh, Putin's Russia will will be a very valuable asset for Iranians' um, own uh, agenda in the Middle East. It's interesting. You made an observation in the book. There's a question here, is the internet available to the public in Russia or any of its major cities? Um, I had the opportunity to take my family, not this past summer, but the summer previous, um, to St. Petersburg and to Moscow. And it was interesting because I found that there were a number of people who would say that they didn't really care for Putin, but they didn't understand why the West didn't really understand that Russia has such close ties with the Ukraine. 
But you make an interesting observation about public opinion in Russia in the book where you say the opinion polls that we all hear are that Putin's uh, policies are very popular. Um, and yet, as you point out, considering that all communications are monitored, even those by the polling people themselves, it's astonishing that he doesn't have a 99.9% .9 approval rating. Now, I think that is what, what do you really, what do you really think that Russians feel about Putin? No. Russians in, in the country, you're in exile at the moment, but in the country, what, what, do you, what do you think that they think of his policies? No, I can speak with confidence all about my own family, that's my mother, but I don't think that their, their opinion will be very different from mine. Um, now, regarding uh, uh, Russian population, yeah, naturally he has support, but it's just, it's, it, it always happens, you know, after years and years of 24-7 propaganda, it's very difficult for people just to see the world, you know, from, from different perspectives. I'm sure that, you know, Stalin's or Hitler's support in 1939 in their respective countries was also phenomenal. So because people just, you know, follow the propaganda line. And uh, it's, again, the experience of dictatorships of the, of the past, of the 20th century, shows that, you know, it's not uh, inconceivable to imagine that even the most civilized countries, you know, could, uh, could be, could reach a state of paranoia with, with, with this skillful propaganda that, you know, um, that galvanizes all the fears against uh, neighbors and creates, you know, some illusions. Uh, now, the interesting thing about Putin's propaganda, that is just if you compare it to the Soviet propaganda, that is, um, Soviet propaganda tried to come up with some kind of, you know, sort of bright mythology. So it is in the future, you know, if we do this, this, and that, if we make all the sacrifices today, eventually we'll reach a point, you know, where, you know, everybody will be happy. So Putin's propaganda uh, offers no uh, vision of the bright future. So it's all, it's, it's kind of a cult of death. It's all about confrontation. It's about enemies. It's about wars. It's about dying. So it's, 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 it, it, it has to, you know, keep the whole country under siege with, with, no, with no exit strategy. Um, and uh, um, a lot of people, you know, they just, you know, they, they're scared. I mean, that's, again, it's just the fear is one of the, one of the sort of uh, uh, prime factors in, in, in any um, uh, propaganda. And uh, um, uh, Putin, you know, keeps, you know, instilling this fear and uh, he points out at enemies and he's very good in creating enemies, even, you know, uh, are fictional enemies, um, and uh, um, I don't think that you know in a country where people you know m most of them denied a chance to hear you know the the, the different opinions, uh, you can rely on any any polls uh, because polls mean that you know people you know debate something, they discuss something, they they hear you know different views, and you know um, will you know will be eventually will, they will be able to reach their own conclusion. So you mentioned Ukraine, and this is an interesting point because, you know, many, I know many people in Russia say, oh, we have close ties to Ukraine, but ask Ukrainians. Not necessarily Ukrainians, Ukrainians, ask ethnic Russians living in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you, hell, so we don't want to have anything in common with these, you know, Putinoids, you know, people who just, you know, who are devoted to Putin. And, uh, you know, for those who say that, you know, the Russians, they have no, um, sort of no genetic memories of democracy and they cannot, you know, uh, rule themselves without an iron feast, so without a dictator. I can point out exactly at Russian-Ukrainian split, you know, when you look at the eastern Ukraine uh, and uh, to take two cities, Belgrade on the Russian side and Ukra uh, Kharkov on the Ukrainian side, you have people who were born and raised in the same country, Soviet Union. There was no border at that time. They all, most of them, they're ethnic Russians. So uh, even after 1991, the collapse of Soviet Union, the border was very formal. People could, you know, travel across the border. So they have been listening to the same news programs. They, were, they have been reading the same books, you know. They had so much in common. But when the moment came in 2014 and Putin in, Putin's uh, forces invaded eastern Ukraine, most of ethnic Russians, actually great majority of ethnic Russians on the Ukrainian side, joined the Ukrainian army defending their country against uh, Putin's invasion. And I think one of the, it's a long story, so I could, I could come up with, with a long explanation, but I think one of the, you know, one of the reasons is that since 1994, with, again, with all the similarities that's, uh, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, there was one fundamental difference. 
The Ukrainian president, Leonid Kravchuk, the first Ukrainian president, lost elections. It was a peaceful transition of power. Since 1994, Ukrainians knew that the government you know, could be changed you know, by, by a vote, through, the, through a ballot. Um, and uh, the, gov the, the government, you know, the supreme power, had no more sort of uh, a sacred status in their minds. And all the attempts of, of Putin's crony, uh, uh, um, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, to change this, you know, both attempts in 2004, 2014 were met by Maidan. And even Putin's invasion was met by the, by quite, you know, uh, sort of, a, by combined efforts of Russians and Ukrainians, ethnic Russians and Ukrainians living in Ukraine because they didn't want to move eastward. They wanted to be part of Europe. Can I play devil's advocate with this for Absolutely. a moment? So as you point out, um, you had one candidate who was elected twice and overthrown twice in the Ukraine. Technically, he was elected once because it's the first time he was not okay. elected, but he claimed to be elected. Um, Timoshenko's reign was not a particularly successful one. Uh, Yushchenko. Yeah, you just, if you talk about president, yes? Yes. Yushchenko, yeah. um, and just this week, the finance minister of the Ukraine, who's actually a technocrat from Latvia, resigned because he said that the the level of cronyism and corruption within the Ukrainian government was such that he couldn't do his job, which you would think that during a national crisis where you have foreign troops on your territory, you might put aside the desire to rob the piggy bank and focus on getting the job done. In other words, to what extent can you actually say, you know what? They deserve it. Um, I'm being very, I told you, uh, I mean, playing I, devil's I, advocate I, to, be, yeah. to be very blunt. At what, yeah. at what, at what point does the, government, the, does the people really have the government that they deserve? Uh, I'm not here to defend the Ukrainian government. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm defending the, uh, the rights of the Ukrainian to choose this government okay. and to live in a country of their choice. And uh, uh, I'm here to defend the territorial integrity of Ukraine by the way, confirmed many times by my country, by, by Russia, by all Russian presidents, including Putin himself, because all Russian presidents and uh, all Russian parliaments over the last 25 years signed and ratified numerous treaties with Ukraine, recognizing Ukraine in its, in its borders as, as uh, of the collapse of the Soviet Union in December 1991, including, of course, Crimea. So I'm here to defend the, the international order, uh, and that's why I believe, you know, that Ukrainians and yeah, did a great job by actually repulsing Putin's offense. Europe and America were not ready to help. I mean, the United States refused to provide lethal weapons to Ukraine, and it was very modest supply. And probably I, would, I should say Obama refused because it was a unique case where not only by, uh, um, uh, uh, both uh, uh, chambers of, uh, of, of the Congress, the House and the Senate, supported it, bipartisan support. It was even supported by John Kerry and, and, and Joe Biden. So basically, it was the decision of one man to deny Ukraine a chance to get armed uh, and to defend it, uh, itself against uh, herself against against Russia. Now, uh, regarding corruption, in the state, I read a few history books, and uh, I learned that you know war actually is quite a good period for those who like to rob the piggy bank. That's yeah, true. it's quite unfortunate. So because you definitely can you know find many many new items in the budget you know that uh, that. Uh, that uh, could, be, um, uh, could be used for uh, personal benefits. Um, but, you know, Ukraine still, you know, it's, it's still a democratic process. I'm, you know, I can watch, you know, Ukrainian television, by the way. Most of the talk shows in Ukraine, they are in Russian because they're run by Russian journalists. Many of them who left, who left, uh, were forced to leave Russia. Uh, it's a mixture of Russian and Ukrainians. Um, and uh, um, it's, you know, it's, you can't expect democracy to flourish, you know, just overnight. But Ukraine is moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, and, and all the problems that you mentioned, you know, yeah, they do exist. And I, you know, and uh, I, 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 some could say it's even, even much worse. But the very fact they discussed in public, and it's, 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 and there will be a next election, and it's people will pay their price for what they do. And um, I, 
I would worry more about Russia than about the future of Ukraine. And uh, let me tell you that if Russia stops you know, um, its intervention, and it's not just you know, annexation of Crimea, occupation of Crimea. It's not just you know, uh, occupation of the, of the um, s uh, relatively small part of eastern Ukraine, much less than Putin wanted. But still, you know, it's quite painful because it's totally destroyed and, it's, and it, it, it's, 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 it's a bleeding wound in, 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 for, for Ukrainians. But it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a regularly clandestine operations because let's not forget Putin is not a military dictator. He's a KGB guy. And uh, there's so much that is happening you know, behind the scenes that we, we do not see. But I have no doubt that on a daily basis they're trying to destroy Ukrainian statehood. That was Putin's goal. At the end of the day, it's not about invading Ukraine. It's making sure that Ukraine as an independent state doesn't leave Russia's orbit. And uh, um, I think it's quite difficult now just to, 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 uh, for Ukrainians, even if they had the best government in the world, to, um, to solve all these problems, though again, I'm not here to defend them, and uh, I'm, I, I, as much as, 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 as you are, I'm appalled by, by this endemic corruption and by the fact that some of the Ukrainian politicians, they are just trying to benefit at a time when country uh, is facing uh, such an, such an um, historical challenge. Well, that leads me then to what usually turns out to be the canary in the coal mine, and that's the Jews. And you point out in the book that one of the justifications for um, Russian intervention in Ukraine was the claim that Ukraine was being taken over by fascists, anti-Semites, ultra-nationalists, and the like. And you say that, in fact, anti-Semitism in the Ukraine, statistically, is less than you would find in France or Germany um, or anywhere else, for that matter. Jews have always been sort of at the vanguard in big changes in Russia. So in the revolution, you had Trotsky, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Kaganovich. You had, you know, the Jews were very much part of the revolution. In the next revolution which took place, you've had many Jews, um, or certainly a disproportionate amount, um, have managed to benefit from the business environment there. By the time Stalin was dying, you had the doctor's plot and what was likely to be a very, very big pogrom against the Jews in 58, I think it was. 53. 53. Where do you see, it, the, the, the easiest path for a dictator to be able to arouse public sentiment, particularly if that class of people are extremely intelligent um, or unusually intelligent or unusually rich, is to be able to build up some form of a uh, resentment towards the Jews. Your Jewish Armenian found out that uh, Susan in our audience, her grandmother was from Baku and she's asking what the state of Jews is there now. I do know they have, Azerbaijan has excellent relations with Israel, that much I know. <coughs> I have no idea, I live in Baku twice. But, years um, ago. Because I'm half Armenian, don't forget. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm you not know, welcome there. Uh, well, you know, th th it's not politically correct to say this, but my Lebanese friends tell me that they have a joke that one Lebanese um, is savvier than two Jews. But even then they will say, but one Armenian is savvier than two Lebanese. So here you are, an Armenian. What is it like growing up and being able to navigate a path where there were obstacles to Jews in being able to achieve certain heights in the academic world and perhaps even in chess, I don't know. What was it like being an Armenian Jew, navigating your way to becoming the chess champion at the age of 22? Um, it, let's go back to Ukraine for a moment because you mentioned correctly that that was one of the uh, sort of the cornerstones of Putin's propaganda pointing out at, uh, at uh, uh, neo-Nazis, you know, uh, taking over Ukraine. Um, but the good news is that, you know, Ukraine has elections. At, at the elec at, at, during the elections, you actually could see the real numbers of people supporting uh, Nazis or not supporting them. 
uh, Ukrainian presidential elections um, uh, in um, actually it's, it was during the, during the war, so in two in 2014 when Poroshenko won the elections, and they had a neo-Nazi candidate. Or you may call him a Nazi, whatever you name. He made two percent. By the way, they also had a Jewish candidate there who made two and a half percent. So it just it, it, you know, it tells you that the, the, the ideas about Ukrainian uh, neo-Nazis strengths, you know, it just it's overblown by Putin's propaganda. I was in Kiev. Uh, twice in December 2014 and then uh, in, uh, in summer to, in, in the spring 2015 I met you know different people in different audiences and you know it's 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 a country where just you know the the, the, the nationality you know played uh, I mean no vital role anymore so one of the oligarchs um, who uh, built you know national defense in um, uh, in Dnepropetrovsk he was a Jew Kolomoisky. So it's the, then he had a problem with, with the government, but it's not because he was a Jew, but because he was, you know, uh, uh, threatening the commercial interests of people supported by the current president. So um, Ukraine doesn't have the same problems as, as Russia today. You, you actually have a wonderful joke about that in the book, about the two, the two fellows. Mm, yes. You want, you want to move on? Go ahead. You, you mm. want to move on? No, 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 it's better if you say it. You move on, move on. Yes, you mentioned that. You move, move on. Well, okay. So, um, so you have no no particular comments about the the Jewish community in Russia? No, it's the I uh, yeah. I, said, I grew up in Azerbaijan, um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, being an Armenian in Azerbaijan was probably more challenging than being a Jew. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, um, yeah, I was half Armenian, half Jewish. So that's definitely you know was not uh, was um, not a complimentary with Soviet authorities, but. But I think the main reason they just, you know, the, they, they, they preferred Anatoly Karpov, uh, though he was ethnic Russian, but, but he was a loyal soldier of the, of the Communist Party. So definitely, you know, I, I was kind of a rebel. So even if, they, even if they didn't show at early days, you know, they, they had a very good sense of what's coming. <laughs> yeah, and uh, um, uh, probably I was lucky that, that the, the moment for me to challenge Karpov was in 84, 85. When the country was about to change, you know, there was a time for Gorbachev, and uh, and I know that you know, this is, if not for this change, I would be able to beat Karpov at the chess board because you know there would be you know other challenges that that I I I, I couldn't um, uh, deal with uh, political uh, challenges. Uh, but I remember that in 1985, in, in August, before our second match was Karpov. Because the first first one was stopped in, in, in February 1985, so um, without an official decision, so I then removed in the second match, and I, I was invited to the Central Committee of the Communist Party and uh, met Alexander Yakovlev, who was Gorbachev's right hand man, you know, very much behind the Perestroika and Glasnost and New Thinking, and uh, I, I remember I came back home, and uh, my mother looked at me and said, "So," I said, "Then let me beat Karpov." <laughs> so that's, it's it's basically you know the uh, the idea was at that time is that you know it's and then Yakovlev convinced Gorbachev uh, that two players both Soviet players let them play and let the best win. So I still had plenty of other problems, but but it's in 1985 uh, uh, I I didn't have to deal with the with the same challenges as as um, before. So to conclude. Um, you're now extremely active, not only in your uh, chess foundation, um, but extremely active in human rights and in being able to convene dissidents uh, to be able to express themselves. Perhaps you could give a little bit more expansion as to how you're occupying your time these days. Well, thanks for mentioning it. So that this is, I have Kasparov Chess Foundation. I started here in this country into um, in 2002, and then we expanded our activities to other continents. Uh, the prime goal was to um, create a blueprint for chess, chess in, in, in the schools. Actually, there are so many kids now, boys and girls in, in this land, that are in, in, in engaged in chess at early age. But unfortunately, you know, it's not, it's, not on a, it's not on television, it's not a mainstream press, so that's why you know, people just don't recognize that this number has been steadily growing. So um, we have been organizing many events around the country. So one of them is the Greater New York, uh, New York 
It's, uh, we do, we, um, we're doing it for 10 years. Uh, and uh, the, the um, last event in January, this, uh, it's just this, uh, January this year, we had a record of 1,700 kids. So just uh, playing for two days uh, in, this, in this massive event. So we also do uh, 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 Greater Chicago, uh, Greater Baltimore, and Greater Los Angeles. Uh, we do uh, All Girls Championship uh, for certain years. They'll be in Chicago this year. Uh, we do program for Young Stars, so for 10 years in cooperation with St. Louis Chess Club. Um, and uh, uh, L L L around the world, so we are also um, promoting this, this agenda more on the educational side. So I just, you know, this morning I got news that uh, in a tiny state of Lesotho in, 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 in Africa, we got, you know, the first commercial sponsorship from, uh, f from local commercial sponsors for 10 schools that we, we have been supporting. So uh, because they could see tremendous results, you know, huge effect on, 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 on kids uh, who are involved in the program. Um, uh, and I'm also chairman of the um, Human Rights Foundation. Um, I, I had an honor to... Um, um, take this position after late Václav Havel, uh, the legendary uh, president uh, of um, Czechoslovakia, uh, one of the most famous dissidents of the 20th century. And uh, Human Rights Foundation um, um, organizes the largest gathering of dissidents in the world. It's the Oslo Freedom Forum, uh, seven events, and uh, we do it every May. Uh, and uh, we, um, we award a special uh, prize uh, for creative dissent, named after Václav Havel. Uh, and uh, we follow um, the human rights uh, um, issues and, and, of course, violations around the world. And uh, we, um, we have no political affiliation. So we just, you know, we, we um, invite to our, to our event uh, defectors from North Korea and gay activists from Uganda. So it's the, it covers uh, um, every, every area where human rights are being abused. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, this is one of the fundamental issues that should be reflected in the U.S. foreign policy to actually pay attention to the violation of human rights, even if they're committed by so-called American allies. So we are not sparing Saudi Arabia uh, uh, um, for this reason or any other country that, that has special relations with the United States because violations of human rights uh, should be uh, um, uh, um, referred as the violation of human rights. And this is one of the challenges of the United Nations because I, I, I can hardly you know, respect any resolutions on the human rights from an entity where Saudi Arabia is, chair, is chairing the, the human rights panel. <laughs> um, um, and um, I keep writing so articles uh, for different publications. I've been uh, writing for the Wall Street Journal for 25 years, but in the last few years, I, I'm, I'm submitting my articles to all publications uh, uh, from um, Wall Street Journal to Daily Beast, you know, political, Time, Newsweek, because I, I believe, again, there are many issues that, that have, um, you know, uh, that, 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 that must be covered, you know, on the bipartisan basis. Uh, and uh, I hope that you know, the free world will just recover the spirit. It's a very important spirit uh, uh, that, you know, helped um, help this country and the free world to win the Cold War. Uh, and... Um, I think it's, it's, it's very important that we'll learn from the great moves we made in the past, actually from our mistakes in the past, to sort of to think strategically for the future because this is, you know, uh, uh, going back to the chess metaphor. So I, I talked about dictators being tactical and playing poker. The strength of democracy is, 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 is a luxury of being strategic because we can rely on institutions built by great statesmen uh, who will not see the results of, 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 of the work of these institutions. And uh, I can go back again to the, to, the, to the 40s and just to remind people that how many institutions were built by the Truman's administration, uh, National Security Council, National Atomic Energy, uh, CIA, the Reform of Voice of America, uh, they backed uh, the creation of NATO, of course, Marshall Plan, uh, West Germany has been formed, the State of Israel, you know, um, has been has been created with with full support of, of this administration. So many of the things you know that that are today are important uh, pillars of, of of our world. They have been created at a time where uh, people who did it they they had no power to envision what what will happen in the future. So when people ask me what we should do today, uh, my response is we have to start thinking strategically. 
we should stop, you know, thinking, oh, this is, this is what will help us tomorrow. It's not about tomorrow, it's about next year, it's about two years, it's about five years. We have to start laying, uh, uh, laying ahead the future, the, our vision of the future. Uh, that's, that's, that's the main strength of democracy. And we should do it together. And again, I uh, urge you know, for the bipartisan cooperation to start thinking about this future. Because you know, if America uh, retreats, you know, the world will, will, will be in chaos. So it's, the, it's, a, it's a sad truth. Uh, but again, America really played a crucial role in, in, in defining the 20th century. And I still believe this country could do a great deal of, of, of um, um, work that will help us to uh, build a brighter future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's wonderful to think that um, someone who is as elevated and with such an incredible frame of reference of history and of current events um, can end on such an inspiring note um, for a book that is entitled, very appropriately, Winter is Coming. Actually, weather is cooperating. And <laughs> I would urge you um, to take advantage of the fact that this man, one of the great icons of our era, um, will be very happy to sign books um, adjacent to the hall. And I'd like to take um, the opportunity on behalf of the 92nd Street Y um, to say how privileged we feel to be able to have you back on the stage and that we wish you and Dasha and your children um, only the best. John McCain was clearly right. You are an extraordinary man and a very, very brave one, and we are privileged to be in your airspace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.